Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's first meeting of 2019. We have apologies from Liam MacArthur. Agenda item one is a decision on whether to take items three and four in private and also whether the, the draft stage one reports on the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill and on the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill should be taken in private at future meetings. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed, thank you. Agenda item two is our fifth and final evidence session on the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome Humza Youssef, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and Karen Ockenclos, Criminal Justice Division, Leslie Baga. Criminal Justice Division and Lise Miller, Director of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. I've already uh, wished the committee um, a happy new year in private session. Now I take the opportunity to wish the Cabinet Secretary and his officials also a happy new year. And can I thank you, um, Cabinet Secretary, for the various submissions to the committee and invite you to make a brief um, a brief opening uh, remarks, some brief Thank opening you. remarks. Thank you, uh, convener uh, and committee, and can I reciprocate and wish you all uh, a very uh, happy new year, and I hope you've had a, a good uh, festive break. But can I also uh, use my uh, statement to thank the committee for what I think has been some extremely thorough and very helpful evidence sessions that we've reflected on uh, in, in, in the run-up uh, to this uh, bill and, and to this uh, particular evidence session. In recent years, significant changes have been made to the criminal justice system to recognise the interests of vulnerable witnesses. Uh, they've included a, a range of measures, strengthened arrangements to extend access to special measures in court that will be appropriate to help children and other vulnerable witnesses out of court, for example, through greater access to remote video link uh, for both summary and solemn cases. However, uh, I believe strongly that more can and should be done to support child uh, and other vulnerable witnesses whilst protecting, of course, the interests of people accused uh, of crimes. That is why this bill is a progressive and ambitious step forward in ensuring that children in the most serious criminal cases are able to have the evidence recorded in advance of trial. I've listened with great interest to the evidence that the committee has taken from a broad, broad range of stakeholders over the past couple of months. I'm very pleased that the overwhelming response has been positive and supportive. Uh, that said, I do accept, of course, that some issues have been raised during those evidence sessions. I think that it would be helpful for me to address very briefly just a few of those issues uh, this morning. I'm aware that many stakeholders have asked how and when we intend to commence the provisions in the bill, in particular, when we intend to use the power contained in Section 3. Uh, we've always been clear that our initial focus would be on child witnesses in the most serious cases. <clears throat> I trust you received a letter I sent to the committee yesterday, providing, of course, that the bill is approved by the Scottish Parliament. This sets out our proposed approach to commencement and attached that letter as a draft impl implementation plan. As members will note, and as set out in the letter, it's important that the provisions in the bill are commenced in a phased, manageable uh, and effective way. And I know that some stakeholders are supportive of that approach. It is of the utmost importance that we do not overwhelm the system and that we get it right for children and vulnerable witnesses. Not to do so uh, would undermine the policy aims of the bill and, more importantly, uh, risk making matters worse for the very people we are seeking to protect. However, as members will note, the Scottish Government does intend and we do intend to extend the new rule to adult deemed vulnerable witnesses in the future. Uh, this would include complainers in sexual offences cases and it's likely that initially this would be commenced in the High Court first. But it's important that each stage of the rollout is evaluated and monitored to be sure that the justice system as a whole is ready to move to the next phase of implementation before we do so. I cannot stress strongly enough that I want to make sure the justice system is fully prepared and that the necessary IT and infrastructure is in place before move, moving from one phase to another. As you, as you are aware, we've already invested as a government uh, almost £1 million to create a new vulnerable witnesses suite uh, in central Glasgow, and have also just made another £1.1 million available to the court service and continuing to work with them in relation to upgrading other venues and IT equipment so the court infrastructure 
is ready for the increase in the number of witnesses having their uh, evidence pre-recorded. Uh, finally, uh, and to end, I'm aware that some concerns have been raised in relation to potential miscarriages of justice. Also, I hope I can allay these concerns because evidence currently is and will continue to be tested. Witnesses continue to be cross-examined and evidenced by commissioner hearings under the new statutory rule. It would also be, of course, uh, under the oversight of a High Court judge uh, or indeed a sheriff. The bill does not in any way undermine the very, these very fundamental principles, nor does it amend the current definition of vulnerability or amend the current special measures. What the bill does uh, is create a statutory framework to enable the greater use of pre-recorded evidence so that our most vulnerable citizens do not have to undergo, undergo the additional stress of having to wait, uh, having to await the court trial before giving evidence. Uh, thank you, Convener. Of course, always happy to take questions. Start our questions with um, Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, <coughs> can I extend my uh, wishes for a happy new year to the Cabinet Secretary? Um, I'd just like to begin by asking the broad question. At its heart, uh, this bill um, has the, the, the uh, um, the view that, that recording uh, evidence prior to, <coughs> to a court uh, uh, case is uh, beneficial to a vulnerable witness. I was just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary could just outline what his views are of what those benefits are, and also the, the potential uh, drawbacks and protections that, that, that are required to be to make sure that uh, we, we still see justice being carried out in our courts. Yeah, uh, I thank the member for his, his good wishes and his question. I, I would say that it's important to recognise, as I know the member does, that of course uh, we're not introducing a new special measure. So the, 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 the pre-recording of evidence uh, by commission uh, can be applied for, uh, does currently take place. Um, although we're obviously, uh, in some respects, uh, creating a presumption when it comes to, to child witnesses. Uh, so already safeguards exist in place for those cases. Um, and so it's important to recognise that a, a commissioner, uh, uh, the, the evidence being taken by a commissioner would be the oversight of a, a judge or indeed a sheriff, if it's a sheriff in, in jury trial. Uh, and so it's important to recognise those safeguards already exist. In terms of the, the, the benefits, I think the benefits uh, in, the, in, the, in the previous evidence sessions that you've taken from organisations such as Bernardo's Children's First, the evidence from those in the legal profession, from the Faculty of Advocates right through to the Crown uh, and others has been really overwhelming uh, in terms of the benefits uh, to the child, uh, but also to the justice system generally. It actually helps to speed up potentially uh, the criminal justice uh, system. Uh, but actually the, the, the really big benefit for, for children, but also I hope when we extend to adult, to demon vulnerable witnesses is, is um, mitigating as best as we possibly can the potential to re-traumatise uh, through the court process and the court proceeding. Um, that, that is something uh, that we know can have a, a long-lasting impact. I think some of the evidence that I've heard, uh, not at the, these committee sessions, but in my, my conversations with the likes of, for example, Rape Crisis Scotland, uh, would tell me that uh, rape complainers uh, will, will often say that the court process not just re-traumatised them, but in some respects was even more traumatic than the actual incident and event itself. So being able to assist, uh, mitigate, I should say, and some of that uh, re-traumatising, uh, assist the court process in terms of efficiency, um, I think there's a lot of benefits, but the, the important point is we have to have safeguards uh, there as well, and, and the current safeguards that exist uh, I think uh, are, are, are fairly strength, are, 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 are fairly good, uh, are strong. But of course, if there is a need for for improvement, uh, then of course we should be open minded to that. Uh, I, I thank the cabinet secretary for that uh, response. Uh, I mean, uh, and again, um, I, I'd agree with much of what he said. Clearly, this will uh, have mean uh, quite a big change for people in the courts, both in terms of the infrastructure required, uh, the free recording over is re requiring uh, technology, but also changes in, in practice. Um, so I thank the, the, the Cabinet Secretary for the, the, the letter he provided, but could he perhaps expand a little bit in, in terms of the assessments that will be made, because it's very much a, a staged and phased approach that's being taken to ensure that, that lessons are learned at each stage, and indeed more time taken if that's required. Could, could the Cabinet Secretary maybe elaborate on, on, the, on how those assessments will be made, both in terms of practice and also in terms of infrastructure? 
Yeah, I think the latter point is, is, is hugely important. In some respects, we are able to look at what is happening in England and Wales, where there's a phased rollout. And, and, and again, the reason that England and Wales are phasing out the rollout uh, is to monitor and, and to evaluate. And I think that's really important for us to, to, to be able to do. I think we have to have a degree of flexibility. It's why in my implementation plan that I forwarded to the committee, um, th there was dates attached to some of, of what we were looking to do, but clearly not dates attached to everything. And the reason for that was because I want to get things right as opposed to just give you an arbitrary uh, date. And, and, and we have to evaluate, we have to monitor. Uh, in terms of, 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 of how that would be done, um, perhaps maybe looked look, some of my officials uh, to, to be able to add uh, some more detail uh, to that, or I can follow up uh, with committee afterwards. Uh, but certainly, uh, we know that even just looking at high court cases involving child complainers and child witnesses, that alone will require uh, quite an upgrading of, of facilities, infrastructure, but also a cultural shift potentially too. Um, what I would say around the infrastructure, IT, um, uh, the IT infrastructure is, is really important. Uh, I was um, very interested to read and reflect upon the evidence that the committee took uh, around, for example, let's take joint investigative interviews, uh, for example, and, and, and a number of those giving evidence to committee saying that they were just not of the quality that, that, that they should be. That alone, if we look at joint investigative interviews, tells us that there needs to be a significant investment in the infrastructure. Now, we're doing that. And I've seen uh, some of that in, in our city, Glasgow city centre location uh, that we'll be using for, for um, ch child uh, interviews by, by commission. Um, so we're investing in that. But clearly, the, impl the, the, the monitoring of that and, and is, is going to be hugely important before we can move on to the next phase. I don't know if my officials won't add anything else around how exactly we'll, we'll do yeah, something like Obviously, that um, since the practice note came in, then there has also been a period of monitoring and evaluation to see how the practice note is bedding in. And we would continue to do so once the legislation is in place. So it'd be working with the Crown Office um, and the Court Service, and it could be things through data collection, seeking feedback on um, the quality of commissions, the volumes of commissions, even just how long a commission has taken, um, because those are all kind of important factors before we decide if we're going to roll out further and, and when we roll out. Um, thank you. Um, so a key question is, uh, I guess, why the, the bill um, stops where it does. I, I, I accept the point about the need for, for caution and so that the phased approach looking uh, at, at child witnesses um, in solemn cases and in particular types of case but then making provision for extension to other types of cases and other types of witnesses I think that all makes sense. What I'm wondering is, is why the bill doesn't make provision for making further extensions and in particular to summary cases because after all, I don't think a child knows uh, to be traumatised just because it's a solemn case rather than a summary case. And in particular, thinking about domestic abuse cases, which may well be being heard under a uh, summary proceeding, I think you can understand that the, 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 the benefits of these measures uh, that might have the child witnesses in those sorts of cases. So I was just wondering why it w uh, the bill didn't include the provision to, to make those further extensions, albeit with the sorts of caveats and, and, and uh, tests uh, already set out by the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think it's a really good question, and, and, and I just hopefully I can give the member some reassurances on, on our thinking and around this. And I'll ask my officials to come in on the back of uh, what I say, if they have anything else to add. The, the, the phased approach uh, is one that I've recognised through the evidence sessions that you've taken has been welcomed by uh, a wide range of, of, of stakeholders, particularly those in the criminal justice uh, field, stakeholders that, uh, from the Faculty of Advocates to the Law Society to, to Lady Dorian, for example, all very supportive of that uh, phased approach because they understand the, the, the infrastructure uh, and, and the resource implication. But I understand also Daniel Johnson's question around having um, uh, something on the face of the bill around somebody because that might be easier to then extend in the same way that we're suggesting for for adult vulnerable witnesses and so on and so forth. What, what I would say to him is a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, there is nothing currently stopping in domestic abuse cases, be they summary or indeed solemn, for there be, to be an application for evidence by commission. So currently, under the current provisions that exist, there could be an application. It would be for uh, for, for, for a sheriff uh, or, or indeed a judge to... to to, to look at that application um, and, and, and to grant it or not. So currently, 
that does exist in domestic uh, abuse cases. Um, I think the other thing um, I would say is that the the difference between the the, the number of cases um, uh, that are, that are presided over uh, in the High Court or solemn cases versus some of the cases, I think he understands the volume and the difference in terms of volumes and the implication that that would have. And I think therefore going through the phased approach that we currently have with the with the list of offences that we currently have is important. I think the third point to make is that if we, uh, when we, I should say, extend to adult deemed vulnerable witnesses. That would include, and I'll just look to my officials to have confirmation, but that would include uh, offences, sexual complaints, uh, but also domestic abuse cases uh, as well. So when we do extend, uh, that will extend to that. Um, when it comes to the list of offences that exists, um, I'm not close-minded, uh, I have to say. Uh, again, I've listened to the evidence, I see domestic abuse, and the issue of domestic abuse has come up from a number of stakeholders. I think we should reflect on that uh, as a government. Um, at the same time, the there is a provision within the bill to amend the list of offences that currently exists uh, or not. So there's two separate issues. One is, although I, I understand that th there's some correlation between the two, but um, you know, the, the issue of including domestic abuse uh, as an offence, and I think we should be open-minded as a government to, 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 to that suggestion, but understanding also the, the implications that that would have. And then there's the issue of extending to somebody, and, and I'm not quite convinced that we have to have something on the face of the bill if we were to go down that route. Um, we would then have to think about the phasing, the implementation, if we did. So the current phasing and implementation is children uh, and, and, and high court, and so in some cases, high court and sheriff and jury, then looking at adult, adult deemed vulnerable witnesses. And again, we'd probably look at the high court first and then look at sheriff and jury. Uh, and then, then would you look at somebody cases and would it be somebody cases involving children first and then would it be somebody cases involving adults? We'd have to think about how we phased all of that. This was a very latter point I make is that if we were to include it for somebody, the very last point I'd make is if we were to include it for somebody cases and create that presumption, it might be unnecessary. So I think it was um, Tim from the... the uh, was it the Crown and Court Service, uh, the Court Service, I think, that, that gave the example of uh, a 16 year old uh, witnessing a bike theft. Um, and the somebody, uh, somebody courts would we would we require for them to to give pre recorded evidence? I'm, I'm not convinced uh, that would be a, a, a best use of time, resource, and so on and so forth. So for all those reasons, um, I think on the domestic abuse front, we should be open minded uh, as a government on 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 the issue around uh, something on the face of the bill uh, in relation to extending to somebody cases. I am not quite persuaded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, do you think, just following Daniel Johnson's line of questioning, do you think that there's a risk uh, that, particularly given that this can be extended by regulation, uh, that the category of vulnerable witness gets extended such that it almost becomes the default position? Uh, and separately on that, do you think there's anything in the assertion that this committee's heard that deeming a witness as vulnerable uh, enhances their, or could enhance their credibility or the weight of evidence that they give? Um, so just on, on, on two points, when it comes to the extension of uh, potential uh, vulnerability, uh, that would be, I suppose, a decision for all of us to make as a parliament. It would have to be done by affirmative order, and therefore, uh, if that was something that we agreed to do, because you're, you're right, there has to be some degree of flexibility. Uh, there's no doubt that... Uh, who's deemed to be a vulnerable witness now, it may be the case that when this parliament, you know, in the 20th year of, of this parliament, that 20 years ago when this parliament first sat down, that perhaps not everybody captured under the current vulnerability would have been captured 20 years ago. So there has to be some element of, of, um, of, of, of flexibility uh, around some of that, but it would be up to the parliament to then make that decision around um, extending that uh, or, or not. In terms of a second point, if I, if I understood it, correctly. Um, the, there was a few stakeholders, I noticed, who were giving evidence to this committee that suggested that there could be more weight put on the evidence around uh, pre-recorded evidence. Uh, and, and would that shift the balance of fairness uh, in a trial uh, or not? Uh, I don't see any evidence of that. People did make that uh, suggestion, but I didn't see any empirical evidence or empirical data to back that up, and in fact, in some of the data that we have, 
uh, would suggest that that isn't the case, that, that, that jurors um, don't give more weight to, to pre-recorded evidence versus evidence heard uh, in, in, in a courtroom. And in terms of safeguards, just go back to my point that, that I made to, to Daniel Johnson, that um, pre-recorded evidence, of course, on commission uh, can happen currently. Uh, there are safeguards currently. There is the fundamental principles of testing that evidence by the defence, cross-examination, all of that continues. And, and of course, the fairness of a trial is still overseen by, by a judge or, or indeed by a sheriff. And I think these are important safeguards. And <clears throat> just staying on this uh, exactly the same topic, if I may, the, do you have any concerns uh, or do you have anything to say in response to the concerns that have been raised that the definition of a vulnerable witness doesn't necessarily predicate on any inherent vulnerability, any inherent characteristic of the witness, but rather the charge that uh, is being made, the allegation that's being made, such that the vulnerability is a function of the charge, not the, the actual vulnerability of the witness. Yes, but I, I think it would be a, a difficult argument to, to completely separate the two. You know, if you are a complainer or, or potentially a victim of, you know, attempted murder or, or uh, you know, a, a serious offence that is, is, is on the list, then it would be difficult to argue that you're not a vulnerable person because you've, you know, you, you know, the, without that crime having been committed, yeah, you may not be vulnerable, but the fact that the crime has been potentially allegedly committed, then then you are vulnerable. I think it's difficult to completely separate the two. What I would say is what else has been raised, I've noticed in committee sessions and evidence sessions, has been that where there are people who have particular vulnerabilities, communications issues, learning difficulties, so on and so forth, um, what more can be done to support them? Now, that's slightly outside of the scope of this bill. Uh, but clearly there's a lot of work being done by government uh, to look at this issue, um, both in terms of children, but also indeed in terms of adult support uh, and, and, and making sure that we have appropriate adult support uh, available too. And I notice also in, in committee sessions there's been talk around intermediaries and so on and so forth. So I think there is an issue around um, how we support those who have, uh, to use Liam Kerr's phrase, I suppose, inherent vulnerabilities um, as well as those who are obviously vulnerable because of the crime that's been committed allegedly against them. Um, if I could press you a little bit more on that topic, um, Cabinet Secretary, clearly um, <coughs> the requirements for an adult and the requirements for a children are going to raise a whole lot of different issues. Um, so while the category of vulnerability not, might not be the issue, it's the procedures, it's just how much... Um, how much of the previously approved, um, I suppose, uh, measures in place and how things will pan out um, when you're taking evidence for children can also be transmitted to apply equally to, um, to vulnerable adults. A lot of different issues raised. So is it appropriate, therefore, to take it as something that's decided under regulation, albeit affirmative, should there be a case for fully looking at this and the introduction of perhaps more primary legislation to look at this absolutely fully, because obviously access to justice is key to ensuring that this whole um, pre-recording and protecting and getting the best evidence is going to work and work well. I completely understand the, the, the thread of, of, of the questioning and I think it's a, a very eminently sensible question uh, to be asking the kind of reassurances I'd hope to, to give to you, convener, and, and the committee uh, wider are. It is precisely the reason why I think the phased implementation is so, so important to be able to monitor, evaluate, learn lessons. So what is transferable uh, in relation to how we do things with children, to vulnerable adults, where there is, uh, there is common commonalities, then we should be able to do that. Uh, in terms of, of, of the obvious differences which you, you refer to, uh, convener, uh, what I would say is that we should still be able to test that as a parliament, even if it is by regula regulation uh, making order. If, if we uh, bring in future primary legislation, uh, the committee convener, you are only too aware of the pressures that we have on this parliament in terms of our parliamentary timetable 
um, with everything that is going on in a wider context, uh, even if we are looking years and years down the line, uh, then we do not know uh, what the parliamentary timetable could look like. Uh, are we then delaying something further uh, for not much gain in the sense that we would still have parliamentary scrutiny around uh, any affirmative uh, order that would take place? Um, again, it would be uh, I would take um, happily suggestions from from around the committee, but um, you know we will be testing uh, this rigorously. But also, when it comes to um, adult deemed vulnerable witnesses, clearly be working with a range of stakeholders from the third sector right the way through to those involved uh, as justice stakeholders to to make sure we have the best practice absolutely in place. And I suppose the last thing I would say is that just that point I've, I've made to the previous two members that. I've, under current provisions, of course, excuse me, evidence can be given by commission, and in, 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 in certain cases. So where we can learn uh, from that, uh, we, we, we should uh, do so uh, as well. I think the point you make about scrutiny is absolutely vital, and there are pressures in parliamentary time, but these pressures can't be allowed to compromise potential <clears throat> access to justice, justice issues. As the Cabinet Secretary will be very well aware, and that's why I, I, I welcome the fact that perhaps you, you don't totally rule out looking and learning the lessons and suggesting there may be a different way forward um, rather than just looking at regulation and affirmative procedure to deal with adults who are deemed vulnerable. Um, you mentioned in relation to Daniel Johnson's line of questions a number of assessments, information, data that you're collecting. Would you be prepared to share these with the committee, Cabinet Secretary? I, I don't see why we shouldn't. If you don't mind, I'll reflect on it with my officials in case there's any particular sensitivities that I'm not aware of. Um, but uh, I don't see why we shouldn't be as open and transparent in this process as we possibly can. That's very can helpful. Mind. Thank you. John. John. Thank you, on that specific point, uh, a cabinet Secretary, um, we had further information sent to us by Police Scotland about a, a form that they have completed. Now, it's specifically in relation to uh, the potential of someone to be a witness at a future High Court, um, and it covers areas like the victim's background, details of vul vulnerabilities identified. It was uh, re referred to as uh, the, the victim's strategy, and it's an agreement between the Crown Office uh, and Police Scotland. And it's just what regard there was to this arrangement, which I understand has been in place since 2014, um, in shaping this legislation, um, because it would seem to me that this is something that the Victim Task Force should look at. It's covering the areas of communication with witness. And, I mean, for instance, to my mind on reading this, and we only got this yesterday, there would need to be a measure of training on the part of an officer completing this, and it's an additional part to the police report that's submitted to the Crown. So, uh, you know, there, there, and there's, there's a suggested format here. Um, so any information that you could make about the existing arrangements and how they are shaping and would influence the legislation would be very helpful. I'd encourage yes. you to do I, that. I, I will happily do that in terms of following up with, with a little bit more detailed information. But, uh, but I just go back to the point that um, evidence by commission can and does already take place. So there are protocols that exist, as the member rightly suggests, between, and you'll know, of course, from his experience, between uh, the police, the courts, uh, and so on and so forth. So already good protocols exist, clearly, if we're going to ramp up the numbers of those, uh, which we hope to do, who are giving evidence uh, by commission uh, and pre-recorded evidence, then, then clearly we have to ensure that the infrastructure is in place and the courts, and the good point that I think the member was alluding to, that clearly it might not just be courts that have to, to, to make sure they have the appropriate infrastructure in place but also and training in place, but also, for example, uh, police uh, as well. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's a point um, well made. Um, uh, in terms of, 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 of the victim's uh, task force, uh, again, we are at very early stages, having had one very productive uh, meeting uh, of, of that task force. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, an open mind to, to what can be discussed uh, at that. I don't know if any of my officials want to come in in relation to particularly police, but uh, if not, then what I can do is make sure that we follow up in, in writing some of that. Yeah, we'll follow up in writing some of that. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning. Um, I'd like to ask about child accused who are not um, included in, in the bill. And as we know, many of them are vulnerable and, and have many issues too. Um, 
I wonder if you could just expand on why they're not included and um, your um, comments on the miscarriages of justice organisation who are advocating that um, more, uh, more should be done to support vulnerable um, accused um, on the face of the bill and, and, and what you think that might be. Yes. Um, just a, a, a few things I would say on, in terms of the child accused. Again, I was just looking over as you were, were speaking the evidence given by uh, Lady Dorian on this, and I found it to be uh, very strong and, and, and very persuasive. As somebody obviously who's an esteemed figure within the, the criminal uh, the, the, the justice system, uh, she has clear experience. And, and it was interesting that uh, the, the very obvious reasons uh, for for why you might not want to, to introduce this measure for for a child accused, I think it's something that's been thoroughly thought about um, because. Ron Mackay is absolutely correct. Uh, there, of course, will be often vulnerabilities in relation to the child that's accused. Now, I've been in, uh, I've been in Poland. I've, I've spoken to young people who are in secure units uh, in our country, and uh, you know, uh, it is it is difficult not to think of those young people themselves. Uh, as, as often being victims uh, for the adverse childhood experiences that they've suffered, um, particularly our, our, our youngest children that are, are, in, are, are, are in the criminal justice system. So I, I do accept her point, but, but there are practical difficulties around uh, an accused. Of course, the accused does not have to give evidence. They can choose not to give evidence. So therefore, any presumption around pre-recorded evidence um, uh, would... would, would uh, uh, would, would, would fly in the face uh, of that potentially. Um, of course, it could uh, that could ultimately, of course, undermine uh, the defence. Um, it also uh, the accused uh, has access, of course, to, to legal representation, which is different, uh, of course, to uh, status to, to, to a witness uh, as well. Um, there could also be uh, potentially issues around. I suppose practical issues, logistical issues around um, where there's a jury involved, uh, the case might have to be stopped, delayed, while arrangements for commission are, to, are being set up. Because, of course, the the to, you know, in most cases, of course, the accused would give evidence after hearing the evidence against him or her. So, therefore, would you have to stop the trial to then take evidence by commission and so on and so forth? So, I think for a whole host of practical. Uh, reasons and also for reasons of fairness in terms of the trial and the rights of the accused, I'm not persuaded uh, that there's necessarily reasons uh, to extend. And I notice that uh, that is shared by a number of those uh, within the legal uh, profession uh, as well. In terms of miscarriages of justice, I'll just go back to the point that I, that I referred to to Liam Kerr uh, as well. I, I did think we, we heard some compelling evidence um, uh, around uh, the perceptions, and I think I would, I would use that word uh, purposely, uh, around perceptions of miscarriage, but it didn't come with much in the way of, uh, that I could see in the way of empirical data or, or, or really substantive data. So there was Ewan um, McIlver, uh, McIlveride from Miscarriages of Justice Organisation Scotland, also some evidence from the Faculty of Advocates around potential for miscarriages of justice, but both talked in the general as opposed to the specific. If there was something specifically within the legislation, and remember, we're not creating a new special measure here. These, these non, this non-standard special measure uh, currently exists. If there was something specific that the Faculty of Advocates or others wanted to come forward with us uh, to, to us uh, or, or to anybody here around in the stage two of the bill uh, around tightening up some of the language used, perhaps, uh, then, then again, I, I would be open-minded uh, to that because I, I, I think we want to make sure that uh, whatever we're doing here, uh, as the convener has said, doesn't undermine uh, the fairness of, uh, of, of of the trial process. Okay, just um, to put a wee point, when we visited the High Court, it was mentioned that um, already the provision exists for child accused not to be in the court during the hearing, but it didn't always happen. So I'm just wondering, is there, is there anything that could be um, firmed up about that to make sure that perhaps, you know, in the face of the bill, this was included, that the accused, you know, should, 
shouldn't be in the court while the trial was, was proceeding? Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure it's for uh, this bill necessarily, but um, certainly uh, this could be something that we could take back to to, to the Crown. We could speak to the Scottish Court Tribunal Service. There's a variety of practice notes at the moment that exist. There's an evidence and procedure review that's taking place. Uh, as well, but I don't know if my officials want to add anything in particular. I think that's something that we would want to discuss further with the court service and, and Crown Office. Okay, thank you. Jenny. Good morning to the panel. Um, I'd like to look and focus rather on uh, taking evidence by commissioner and obviously Lady Dorian's practice note has increased the, the use of taking evidence by commissioner and cabinet secretary in your opening statement you spoke about the necessary infrastructure and IT being in place. Um, are there then any practical difficulties in terms of how taking evidence on, by commissioner is operating in practice at the moment? Yeah, I think some of your evidence was very compelling around, for example, if I took joint investigative interviews, that the quality was just not good enough. And, and, and um, actually, this is something the Solicitor General uh, herself has, has said to me, uh, that we need to improve uh, and, and, and upgrade the IT system. So, yes, yeah, there's some infrastructure issues. So that's why we've, excuse me, looking to invest what we're investing uh, in the IT uh, in the, in the IT infrastructure. I actually had the pleasure of visiting the Glasgow city centre uh, location, the, 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 the suite that will be used for um, pre-recorded evidence for special measures, uh, which the Scottish Government is backed by, by just shy of a million pounds uh, as well. And, and, and that is state of the art uh, in terms of its facilities, but also uh, the technology uh, is, is it's the latest technology. So hopefully that gets around some of that. Um, I think we shouldn't be complacent around any of this and that's why uh, the member may be aware there's there's 33 recommendations uh, around joint investigative interviews uh, and on how to improve them they're taking, being taken forward by police scotland social work scotland scottish courts and tribunal service crown office procurator fiscal service and so on and so forth so there's a lot of work being done i think it's a good point that um you know we need to make sure that we are really confident that we have good infrastructure in place because if we don't, then ultimately uh, we could be impeding justice as opposed to, 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 to of course, helping justice uh, run its course in an, in an efficient manner. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, the timing of taking evidence uh, by Commissioner, Lord Justice Clark um, appeared in front of the committee previously and, and told us that when children in particular are asked to give evidence at a time that is remote from the event, not only has their memory diminished, but they are more likely to be confused by general questioning about the incident and in cross-examination might come across often wrongly as being shifty or unreliable. Indeed, they not only find it difficult to deal with questions at that stage, but are more inclined to agree with the questioner when they cannot remember something. I was quite struck by that evidence at the time. With that in mind then, is there an opportunity perhaps in the legislation to expedite the time between reporting and taking evidence and trying to get that right? Yeah, I, I was also taken by that uh, evidence. I thought it was very strong. Uh, indeed, and of course, any of us that have ever interacted with children, worked with children, of course, Jenny Ruth uh, will, will have experience uh, of this. We could recognise exactly what Lady Dorian uh, was, 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 was saying. So um, I, I'm not sure that it's necessarily for the face of this bill. I think the practice note uh, helps uh, absolutely uh, with some of this. Uh, of course, uh, when it comes to this legislation, uh, passing taking evidence by commissioner, uh, for example, we're suggesting you don't have to wait for indictment. Uh, for that to happen, so it could be in some cases, though I, I do accept that it would be rare for there to be evidence by commission pre-indictment uh, as well. I think if, I, if I'm also correct, we remove the barrier around seven days for consideration. Uh, I think it's seven days uh, that there has to be uh, for, for a reason that I'm not too sure uh, why it exists, but seven days before the, the application uh, can be considered, that is removed uh, also. So therefore, uh, I think we're able to speed up uh, some of that uh, as well uh, and of course uh, have announced specific funding for sexual offences and to speed up sexual offences in particular um, 1.1 million uh, 300,000 and 800,000 uh, to, to the court service and crown uh, respectively so uh, yes uh, speeding up cases hugely important but I think a matter much wider than this piece of legislation. Thank you. And just finally, in terms of ground rules, um, I did previously ask Lady Dorian about whether or not the bill should be more specific in terms of what they should cover. I just wonder, Cabinet Secretary, do you have a view on that point? Um, no, I, I think, again, that the, the practice note uh, is, 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 a, is, is probably the best place for the detail of that to be in there. So I think it's good for the and it's important for the legislation to, to be high level. 
uh, if we were too prescriptive in legislation, again, it goes back to some of the points I've made already, uh, legislation can be fairly rigid, can be a bit more difficult to, 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 to amend. Having the, the, the detail in the practice note, which is quite lengthy, actually, it goes with quite a few pages, it covers everything from whether wigs should be worn or shouldn't be worn, right the way through to oaths and affirmations, et cetera, et cetera, the timings, need for breaks. Uh, I think that is the right place for the detail of that, and the legislation should just take the, the kind of high level. Uh, if not, if we were too prescriptive, I think, uh, if we were to try to evolve uh, our practices in the future, um, it would be difficult to do that if, if most of uh, that detail was in primary legislation. Thank you. Uh, Rona, yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yes, you mentioned intermediaries earlier, and I just wonder if you could um, say whether you think, you know, should that be in the bill? Most of the evidence we've heard has been favourable towards the use of intermediaries, so can I have your... Views on that, please. Yeah. Again, I was really compelled by the evidence uh, around intermediaries. I, I don't think it's for this bill. I should say I think this bill is quite narrow in scope, uh, purposely designed so so that we can hopefully make the progress that we want to make around um, child witnesses and then adult deemed vulnerable witnesses. Um, intermediaries is a much bigger, much wider issue. Um, I think there's a strong argument around you know, better use and, and more use of intermediaries. Uh, in the criminal justice system, um, I, th I thought the the quote from from Lady and Dorian, Lady Dorian um, was, was was quite compelling uh, in, in that point uh, as well. So she said very much in favour of intermediaries in general, uh, but whether this uh, is the stage to try to introduce them into the bill, I'm not sure. Uh, I would agree with her because I think um, it is a much bigger, much wider issue that could have implications for other parts of the criminal justice system. So uh, yes to Looking further at the use of intermediaries um, is more of an issue, obviously, as you would understand, for for the Crown and, and, and the courts, but um, probably not in this legislation, is my, my view. Okay, thank you. On that point, Daniel? So, so just connecting the point that Jenny Goldruth made around um, <laughs> what the Ground Rules hearing should cover and also the intermediary point, and I, I accept what the Cabinet Secretary is being made, but the that currently it, it, it says that um, the, the Grand Rules Secretary may consider what support is required, uh, and yet we're hearing <laughs> from some third sector organisations that they're, they're finding a very, very kind of uh, short period of time before hearings proceed that, that, that a vulnerable individual might be uh, giving evidence. Um, and I was just wondering whether or not that, that uh, should be a presumption that support should be provided or, or found for vulnerable witnesses, rather than just that it, it may be considered, which stops short of the, it's not a, an intermediary, but at least makes some step towards the, the, the advantages of having that additional support for vulnerable uh, people giving evidence uh, uh, gives. Uh, I can see where Daniel Johnson uh, is coming from. I think the important thing to say at the moment is that there obviously is no legislative bar that exists if a person required uh, assistance, um, whether it was communication needs or, or other needs. Um, there, there, there is provisions that exist at the moment uh, to allow that um, to, 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 to happen. Uh, also note that senators of the College uh, of, of Justice consider the bill's provision will also enable a commissioner to consider permitting uh, such support uh, if they deem necessary to a particular witness. So the bill does address that uh, in, 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 in somewhat an indirect uh, way. In terms of making that support available as a presumption. It goes back to my point to Rona Mackay that we would have to look at the issue much more broadly. You would have to have things, I think, for example, you know, would you have a, a registered intermediary scheme um, you know, that, 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 we can, that, that, that we could you know, uh, have this pool of intermediaries that existed? If, that, if we were to have that presumption, we just don't have that pool that exists at the moment. What is the training they would have to go through, the resource involved uh, in some of that? So uh, I'm not sure I'm convinced by necessarily having a presumption of a, an intermediary where we have to, what we have to do and what we should do, which I think is outside the scope of this bill, um, is look to see how we can improve access to intermediaries. Uh, are they being used in the best way possible? I think I agree with Lady Dorian's point that um, as, in, in general we should be looking at this issue, um, but uh, I'm not convinced it's necessarily necessary for this bill. And Fulton. Uh, good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, you said um, a, a couple of times earlier in response to, to previous questions, you mentioned uh, joint investigative interviews and, uh, and their use as prior statements. Are you able to comment on the level of use and what you see as the main difficulties with them? 
I can't hear you this again. Uh, in, in terms of the joint investigative, uh, I mean, uh, the joint investigative interviews, what the level of use are as prior statements, and um, what you see as the main difficulties. I don't have figures on, on terms of the, the, the level of use of them, um, but uh, you know I found, I found the evidence taken at this committee to be uh, quite compelling uh, in terms of some of the difficulties um, that, in some cases, it really delayed trials. Um, just the quality of, of the joint investigative interview just uh, wasn't at a good enough standard. Um, uh, and, and, and that actually delayed trials, delayed uh, that from, from taking place. Uh, in terms of um, some of the evidence, uh, other evidence uh, that, that, that came forward, um, I noticed uh, and I was pleased to hear that uh, the stakeholders were looking at this issue um, uh, in, 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 in a serious manner. Uh, the evidence and procedure review, uh, you know, the, the 33 recommendations, the fact that there are 33 recommendations to better strengthen um, joint investigative interviews uh, in itself um, shows that uh, there are obviously improvements that can uh, and should be made. So um, those recommendations are being taken forward by the appropriate partners, uh, social work obviously included uh, within that. I think it's important to do that. Um, I should say from our government's point of view, we've also uh, committed over 300,000 uh, to a joint project uh, led by Police Scotland and Social Work Scotland. Uh, that will create a revised model for, for joint investigative interviews also develop a training programme uh, which recognises the depth of knowledge and skills required for that particular uh, interview process. Uh, we'll design a national standard of quality for GIIs, which is important um, as well. And as I say, there's a separate working group that's taking forward um, the justice-related recommendations, uh, including the rollout of new IT uh, and so on and so forth. So I would say that there's a lot going on in terms of the, the joint investigative interviews um, that will work in parallel or certainly in alignment um, with this bill moving forward. It, um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, you, you touched on the, the, the training angle there as well. And I, I know this is something you might not be able to answer just now, but do you think that if the, if the task force were to proceed to, to recommend something along these lines, that it's something you'd be supportive of and that, that would be a, a more a national um, a, you know, approach to, to joint investigative interviews? So like an, a, or, or you know, one specialist unit rather than it being in local authority areas. Yeah. I mean, uh, the national standards uh, point is is really important. So uh, you know th th that that uh, joint project which I talked about, which will design the national standard for quality assuring GIs, I think is uh, is hugely important. Uh, you know, the point that Vulton uh, makes is, is one that uh, the Solicitor General, for example, has made to me before around the differences in quality. Uh, different regions or different local authority areas uh, around the country is, can sometimes be quite stark. And we don't want that to be the case, that justice is, is delayed or indeed impeded in one part of the country, but is, is running efficiently in another part because of the quality of, of a GI, particularly in this, uh, you know, this, this era of technology that we live in. Um, you know, we, we, we should be up, for, up to that challenge. So hopefully I've reassured the member with the work that we're doing and our partners are doing on this, uh, that we're, uh, we're, we're, we're moving forward at a pace. Rona. Thanks, Convener. Um, yes, before Christmas, uh, the committee had, uh, we had a visit to Norway and we had the opportunity to visit um, a Barna who's there. I think it's fair to say we were all very impressed by it. Um, can you tell me what your view is on the possibility of Scotland adopting this model and what the difficulties or benefits and or benefits could be in us doing that? Yeah. Well, thank you uh, for the question. I, I would be quite interested at some point to be able to sit down with various members of the <coughs> Justice Committee to uh, hear from them their experience of the visit to, to Norway. I think it was in uh, kind of the beginning, middle of December, wasn't it, yeah. that the visit took mm -hmm. place? So uh, I didn't really have the chance at the, the, the end of the year to, to catch up uh, with Justice Committee uh, members. I'd be quite keen to, to hear your own direct experience. I haven't travelled to either a Nordic country or others to, to see the Barnhouse model for myself. I've obviously had a variety of meetings with stakeholders and, and officials, uh, but I think there's a very different experience you get seeing that model. Uh, up close, so hopefully there'll be an opportunity to, to be able to have, to have a direct conversation with some members of the Justice Committee about th their thoughts uh, on some of that. In terms of um, our, our own government uh, approach, it should be said that we're extremely interested in the Barnhouse concept, and it's one that um, we have mentioned and the First Minister has mentioned in um, her programme uh, for, for, for government. Uh, also, um, slightly separate issue, although interrelated to the one that we're uh, obviously clearly um, discussing. I think there's a couple of things to say. One is that the Barnhouse concept 
um, is applied differently in different countries. So the model you saw in Norway, um, the, the system in Norway, uh, the Barnhouse concept in Norway, justice-led, whereas in other countries uh, will be slightly more health-led um, and, 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 and uh, can apply differently in, in different countries. So I think it's important from our perspective uh, that we retain that flexibility. Also, differences with Norway. Norway is just a system more inquisitorial, or slightly more adversarial in terms of uh, justice system. So we have to think about um, those uh, important uh, differences. The actual bill itself, uh, the reforms I think are an important, um, the important reforms in the short term. Absolutely, uh, things like giving pre-recorded evidence in advance of a trial. It's possible that uh, if there was to be a, a child house, you know, a barn house piloted here in Scotland, that the the the, the, the ways of the, how we do that pre-recording, um, joint investigative interviews, evidence by commissioner, they could all be incorporated into a potential future child to child house, a barn house uh, concept. Um, that there aren't plans, I should say, to have just one forensic interview of a witness because, as I say, our legal system is slightly different. Um, the defence has to has the opportunity to directly test that evidence. Um, but it is a concept we're interested in. Um, it's one that there's work uh, being done uh, by the Scottish Government, particularly on the justice field. Um, I did write to the committee before recessing, uh, before recess announcing the commissioning uh, of Health Improvement Scotland in partnership with the Care Inspectorate uh, to develop uh, Scotland-specific standards uh, for Barnahus, uh based on the promised quality standards. Um, that work will begin early this year. Uh, it will take around about 12 months because it will include extensive consultation. Um, once that's published, uh, the standards will form a framework for health, justice, local government to understand what's required in terms of our collective response to child victims and hopefully provide a roadmap to developing our approach to Barnahus, uh in Scotland. And Of course, I'll keep this committee and parliament updated on that progress. Thank you. I wonder just on the point of the forensic uh, model, interview model, which I think we're all very impressed with and the results were, were really quite outstanding. Um, Lady Doreen, when she gave evidence, did say that she thought this would be possible and she, she covered this in her level one vision report. Has the Cabinet Secretary had a chance to look at this? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't looked at the level one uh, report. Um, but uh, you know, I, I would be more than happy to speak to be it Lady Dorian or indeed others that are involved uh, in the criminal justice system, uh, those that have experience of it uh, as, as legal professionals to take their view. Of course, we should do that. Uh, my understanding was to, the kind of one forensic interview would be difficult in the justice system that we have because of precisely that point I was making earlier to, to Rona Mackay around um, the, the ability to test evidence, to cross-examine and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, but if, of course, uh, we should be open-minded if, 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 if those in the justice system are, are saying that there's a, uh, th 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 there are better ways of doing things, then of course, uh, you know, we should be open-minded to that. Mm -hmm. I think that would be very welcome because, as I say, we were also impressed with the forensic interview model. Daniel, is so, so, I mean, just following directly on from both what Ronan Mackay and, and, and Margaret Mitchell were just asking. So, I mean, the, the interesting point about the, the Norway model, uh, I think, are twofold for our experience. First of all, I mean, Norway is, 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 does have adversarial elements. Um, and so, for example, within the, the Norwegian system, the Defence Council does have the right to uh, have a follow-up interview so that cross-examination can take place. It just doesn't uh, very often get exercised. And critically, the other element is that it's, it's police-led, so it's highly trained police officers conducting the interviews. So in essence, what that model looks strikingly like is, a, is an enhanced uh, JII, albeit within a very specialised facility and other services being available at the same time. So if you, com if you, you combine that with Lady Dorian's uh, insights in, in her report, one wonders whether or not it doesn't provide some model in terms of long, a long-term aim, in terms of enhancing JIIs, because as we know, that can be admitted as evidence in chief. Um, and therefore, there's the outline of a, of a long-term model. I was just wondering if the, the Cabinet Secretary might reflect that, that that may be something to be examined and developed by the Scottish Government. I, I will reflect on, on, on that. I suppose the point I would make is, by bringing in health partners as well as local government partners and justice partners together, 
to, to examine this, explore this, to, to, to bring forward a roadmap on, <coughs> potentially on, 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 on the road to, to developing Barnahus concept fully in Scotland. I don't think I would quite make a decision yet on whether it should be justice-led, health-led, so on and so forth. I want to make sure it's as, as, as holistic um, uh, as possible. Uh, as I say, there are other Barnahus concepts and models other than the Nordic model, not the Norwegian uh, model in particular, so we should look uh, at, the, at the broad spectrum uh, that exists. Um, interesting what he says around the Norwegian model in terms of the almost a maybe I'm putting words in the mouth here, but almost a presumption against cross-examination that only happens in the, in, in, in the exceptional cases. Uh, obviously, our system is <coughs> very, very different to that. So how would the likes of the Faculty of Advocates, Law Society, others, what, what, what would their be? What would their thinking be? And, and, and how could we, if we went down that route, uh, how could we reassure them in terms of the fairness uh, of, of the trial uh, process? Uh, because we know that Scotland has a very unique legal system, unique justice system. Um, and and uh, we know how fiercely that uh, is, is is guarded. So yeah, I, I certainly will reflect on what he says, and I will also, uh, as, as the convener suggests, look at the level one report, discuss with Lady Dorian in, in a future uh, conversation, also on her thoughts on this, as well as uh, others in the in the justice system. Um, but we are in a good place that we are um, that the, the reforms in this piece of legislation could be incorporated potentially into any uh, Barnow whose concept. Uh, but also we have all the partners. Who are doing some important work in 2019 and will be doing some important work in 2019 over the next 12 months to bring forward some of these issues and, and, and help us further down the road of having a barn whose concept here in Scotland. Yeah, I suppose really um, I can't come in to the Cabinet Secretary enough. Um, going to see Barnhouse for himself because there is the opportunity for the um, the, the legal representatives to listen to the ed evidence and for points to be put um, in, in a very, um, very efficient and effective and sensitive way where um, everyone seemed to be very happy with it. So I think for the Cabinet Secretary and his officials to see that for themselves, it really would be very worthwhile. Lisa's on to our next line of um, questioning. Shona. Good morning. Um, I want to focus on communication with and support for victims and witnesses. Uh, in the supplementary evidence that you've sent in, it's very helpful, obviously reiterates the £17.9 million um, committed to support victims of crime, including to third sector organisations. I guess I wanted to focus specifically on the, the Victims Task Force, which I think met for the first time on the, the 12th of December. And I guess just to get an idea of how you see the work of that task force uh, having synergy and dovetailing with this bill, given that timing-wise, obviously this bill is where it is and the task force is at the early stages of its consideration. So what are your thoughts around uh, how emerging themes from the task force could um, impact on this bill uh, going uh, through Parliament? And um, I guess also where you see um, other areas in addition to the, the task force um, being um, used to improve the communication with and support for vulnerable witnesses more, more generally. Yes, that's a good question. Um, at the first meeting of the Victims Task Force, which uh, I reiterate was, was, was extremely productive, um, we were very cognisant of the fact that there's a variety of pieces of legislation going through the mm -hmm. Parliament that could potentially impact upon victims. Uh, this is one of them. I know you've obviously also been taking uh, evidence in Management of Offenders Bill, for example, mm -hmm. and what impact that might have on victims uh, <coughs> as well and their perception of the justice system and their experiences uh, within the justice system. And then there's some of what we're doing that is non-legislative uh, as well. Uh, for example, uh, our commitment in the programme for government to bring forward uh, a plan on restorative justice uh, by spring 2019 uh, as well. So there's a whole lot of legislative and non-legislative measures which the Victims Task Force uh, are very cognisant of. Um, whether we create a separate subgroup on that or whether we have officials who will input into the task force with uh, the update on legislation and, and, and non-legislative measures going through this parliament, the impact upon victims, we've yet to decide and we'll, we'll get to that position, uh, I, I think, um, shortly uh, as well. Um, if she, uh, the, the other thing I would say is that there's also a lot of research 
going on into how mm. we can improve the court experience in particular and, and how we can improve, I would say, wider the criminal justice system um, uh, for, for particular offences and particular vulnerabilities, uh, sexual offences and rape being probably the top of that list. Uh, we know that um, in the High Court, uh, last time I spoke to the Lord President, I think the figure he used was that around about 70% of cases coming to the High Court are, are sexual offences and, and rape cases. Uh, I don't have the evidence for that, but it's certainly from the Lord President. So, you know, the majority of cases coming to the High Court um, are sexual offences and rape cases. Uh, and therefore, um, there's a whole range of things. One is providing, of course, the financial support to the likes of Rape Crisis Scotland and, and Victim Support Scotland and others. But there's then the important jury research that we're doing as well that is looking at um, a whole suite of... of, of uh, uh, measures um, from from uh, you know this, this follows on from the debate in this parliament around corroboration uh, and the removal or not of corroboration and the other safeguards that exist uh, within the system and uh, you know this is all part of that conversation so um, I think uh, yes there, there are certainly um, th this legislation certainly will be looked at by the victims task force or at least uh, will have cognizance of it and be able to feed back into it but there's a whole load of things that are non-legislative this parliament is also, and this government is also looking at, uh, that uh, that I think is important for us to make sure that uh, has alignment with the victims' task force also. So it might be helpful for you to come back to the committee if you go down. I think you mentioned there uh, the possibility of a subgroup looking at the various pieces of legislation and whether emerging themes from the the task force would potentially impact on that. It would be helpful, I think, if you were to come back, if that's a route you decide to go down. Um, because I think timing is maybe a bit of a challenge here, because there may well be important elements um, emerging from the task force, which you know could colour the, the government's view on various pieces of legislation um, going through Parliament. So that would be helpful. Um, in, in terms of the um, the bill uh, itself. Um, I mean, obviously, the communication with and support for victims and witnesses is is really critical um, here. And it would be in terms of the restorative justice action plan by the, the spring of 2019. Um, is that going to um, look at both legislation and non-legislative? ways forward and again I guess it would be helpful looking at all of the pieces of legislation you know to set out a, a, a very clear um, consistent way of of witnesses and um, victims being supported because there is a lot of work going on in this area and I guess consistency uh, and consistency of message is very, very important here. So would you see that plan as being a way of pulling some of that together? Um, or how, how would you see making sure that there, there is a consistency there across yeah. all of this work? So a couple of points I make. One, one, in terms of the Victims Task Force, I suppose it's important to say that the vast majority of the stakeholders around that task force are stakeholders that you as a committee engage with regularly mm. when bills are coming through the parliament. So, you know, you regularly engage with Rape Prices Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, so on and so forth. So, and of course, even the, the um, uh, other partners, uh, such as uh, Scottish Courts Tribunal Service, the Crown, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, fair to say that um, they, many of them are, are very alive to the legislative issues that are coming through this parliament. Um, so that's why I'm not sure whether we need a subgroup or actually it's just a case of both officials and 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 and, and, and organisations and others feeding in and, and making sure that we are um, we're, we're, we're taking uh, cognizance uh, of those issues uh, as the victim task force moves forward, because they're already very much inputting into this legislation. In fact, so even on this piece of legislation, you've had some of the victims task force stakeholders uh, giving you giving you evidence um, as oral evidence, but you've also had some of them giving you uh, written evidence, no doubt. Uh, as well. In terms of the second part of our question, in, in terms of restorative justice and action plan, yes, possibly um, it could it could draw in. Uh, I think it should look at, of course, legislative and non-legislative measures, absolutely. Um, again, if we can do things without primary, introducing primary legislation because of the real pressures on our parliament and our committees, 
uh, and indeed the government, of course, uh, on, on when it comes to legislation, then then if we can do it without introducing primary legislation, I think better. Um, there are some good models. Uh, Northern Ireland, um, for perhaps historic reasons, uh, is fairly well advanced when it comes to restorative mm -hmm. justice. Um, and I think there are other jurisdictions we could look at, again, respecting the uniqueness of the Scottish justice system, a legal system. Notwithstanding that, there are other jurisdictions we can look at. Um, in terms of the wider framework and, and, and what we do around victims, I think the Victims Task Force is absolutely the right place to, 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 to do that. Um, there, there, there are many issues that the task force is already going to be quite engaged in and looking at. Um, there are common themes that I think all of us around this table would, have he would hear from victims. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, having to retell their story, mm. be re-traumatised through the court process and so on and so forth, that we'd immediately try to get to work. Uh, some of that will include legislative measures, but a lot of that, I have to say, I think, in fact, I think I can say quite confidently the vast majority of that can be done without any legislation. I mean, I think that's helpful because I think the focusing, you do say that in your submission, that, you know, driving forward a, a new victim-centred approach to reduce the need for victims to have to retell their story to several different organisations. I think that cuts through, you know, so many um, areas that this committee is looking at. It's a th thing we've probably all heard uh, often. And I guess that's the point I was making about, you know, if we keep something at the heart of this that is the overriding principle um, throughout whether it's pieces of legislation, you know, like the current one we're looking at, or whether it's um, with Scottish government policy more generally, um, I think that would be something that I would feel should be at the heart of it, because it's something we hear very often. Good turn um, again to the task force and um, just the, the inclusion of that in the government's submission. Can I say I very warmly welcome um, the introduction of this dedicated task force, which Cabinet Secretary and Lord Advocate are, are chairing. And I note that you, you're very keen to hear the voices of victims and their families. How will you advertise this? How will you make that um, known to people so that they can come forward with their experiences and views? So something we discussed quite extensively at the first meeting, the Victims Task Force, you know, what is the best way to do that? Because ultimately, you know, it would be impossible, as the committee would recognise, to, to get the views of every single victim uh, directly in terms of uh, kind of orally. Um, so, so we have to think about how, how, how we do some of that. Um, the way we left it the last the Victims Task Force meeting was essentially to take the advice, to, 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 to leave the third sector organisations such as Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis Scotland, um, there was a few others that, 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 were, that were present, to take that away because they deal with victims, VSS of course and others, they deal with victims on a day in, day out basis and for them to present to us how that should be done and what's the best way because there was a fair bit of discussion uh, should we have a a committee, almost evidence type of session with, with victims and families of victims. But that was thought maybe that's a little bit too intimidating, almost in a sense. Um, should it be a more, almost an open workshop type of uh, event? I, I'm really open-minded to it, I have to say. I'll, I'll be guided by uh, the likes of Victim Support Scotland. In terms of who's there, I think we need to make sure there's a range of, 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 of voices. It's clearly families that have taken the very brave step um, of, of speaking out about their own experience, which is incredibly difficult. Uh, I can imagine to do, especially when we're talking about traumatising and re-traumatising, that is a really difficult thing to do. So I think hugely important that we include um, some of those voices, um, families like the family of Michelle Stewart or, or, or the family of uh, Sean Woodburn. Or, you know, I think it's important that we include those voices. Um, but we also want to make sure that people that have been involved in the range of different uh, crimes, have been victims of various different crimes and offences, um, we want to capture that as well. So I see it as an, as, as, as an iterative process. I don't see it as just one meeting of victims and the families. It may be that that we actually have almost a, a parallel structure that ex sits next to the Victims Task Force. I should say the Victims Task Force itself, of course, has the voices also of direct victims too, Lindburn uh, being, being uh, perhaps the most well-known uh, who, who lost her son. Uh, he was tragically murdered. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, her son Sam Burns uh, at a house party. So we do have victims inputting directly into the task force, but also there's an understanding from all of us that we have to f feed in as wide a range of voices as possible. Yeah, I think specifically um, why we look at prior to giving evidence, why we give um, support during the trial, 
after it's finished is, is absolutely crucial. And I think there are people who are more vulnerable than others, having given evidence and having passed these measures, it would be a real shame, a, a real tragedy, in fact, if um, people were encouraged to give evidence and then at the end of the day say, I wish I hadn't because of the repercussions. So can I ask a sec the Cabinet Secretary to look at specifically maybe more closed communities, maybe a rural village setting where it can be more difficult when you have to return to that setting. And just by the, the scale, the small scale of um, where the incident has taken place, everyone knows exactly who has given evidence and um, there may be power structures in other closed communities. So if the government could issue a call for evidence to allow people to come forward, and sometimes that would need to be, I think, um, in private to uh, protect them further so that they could give you a full understanding of um, what can be the repercussions, I think that would be very much welcome. Can I ask just more generally in terms of um, communi communication, we're looking at a wraparound service, we're looking at the holistic approach, but um, that's going to fall down pretty badly if we don't have a practical system of communication so that everyone is fully up to speed um, with where we are with the, the victim and their family. Is that something that the Cabinet Secretary has considered? Uh, yes, I can I just make reference to both points that I think the convener made very well. The first point, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the amount of the number of victims I speak to that uh, feel that after the court process has taken place that there's just nothing in the way of, or very little in the way of support. And victim support's got to tell me that uh, directly. Um, and, and we often talk about through care for, for prisoners, which is right and, and it's really important because it helps to reduce reoffending. The question is, where's the through care for, for victims and for, 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 for others uh, as well? So there, there is structures that exist, but I think there's absolutely more that we can do for sure. And I wouldn't, argue with that uh, in, 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 in the slightest. So uh, I think there's a lot that, that, that can and should be done uh, on that. The Victims Task Force will we'll look at that. And I think the second point on that, that the convener made around closed communities or, or the differences between a rural setting and, a, uh, and an, an urban setting, again, were discussed quite extensively. Uh, I could give experience, uh, as you'd expect, perhaps from, from, from the, the, the ethnic minority community, particularly the, the subcontinent Asian community, where you know, I've come across, uh, unfortunately, a variety of examples of very brave women who've, who've spoken about domestic abuse and then just felt that they, they, uh, their return to that community, uh, they, would, they would have to move away because you know, they were just too vulnerable. So uh, I think it's a really good point and one that the Victim Task Force is looking at. Just in terms of the communication point, just so I understood the, the convener uh, appropriately uh, and correctly, we we will certainly look as a task force, and we're looking already as a, as a government around the victim notification scheme. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the kind of thing that she's speaking about, because it's clear, again, from speaking to victims and families of victims, they don't often feel that um, the victim notification scheme goes far enough. They think that it could be widened out to further offences. Um, they think it could be uh, better in terms of communication. There's clearly an issue from victims um, that they don't feel that they are given enough information around the entire process of when somebody is imprisoned, then the potential for them to go out and first grant of temporary release, to be at home uh, in terms of uh, unescorted leave, escorted leave, um, and then, of course, eventual release, the pro system, etc., etc. Now, that's all being looked at in relation to the pro system. Um, the first grant of temporary release side of things, um, that will be no doubt part of what the, the Victims Task Force uh, considers and the Victim Notification Scheme will also be part of it. It wasn't specifically, I know we're very aware of keeping the victim informed, um, but it was the team that's actually looking after the victim and their family, oh, I see. Um, making sure that they, I think Bernard has made the point, I think Police Scotland made the point, and other witnesses very forcibly made the point, communication was absolutely essential, that everyone was up to date, so it wasn't even a case of getting the expert person there, it was ensuring the whole team were up to speed and knew exactly where they were with the victim and you know what support had been given, where the problems were, etc., so that they could be as effective as possible. Yeah, yeah. I think um, again, the victims' task force hopefully will help with that because it'll bring, it brings the police uh, to, to, to the table as well as other partners. The other thing the Victim Support Scotland will do this year uh, is, of course, introduce their, their, their homicide service 
um, though we're still discussing the name, uh, whether that is the most appropriate or not, but certainly a kind of almost a, uh, one, uh, one, one, one person uh, there who, or one stop shop almost, uh, in terms of providing support for an individual right throughout that really traumatic process uh, and making sure that other partners are very much informed about what's going on. Uh, that that would be a good almost test pilot for exactly what the convener is talking about. Thank you very much. Very encouraging. John. Thank you, Convener. To follow on to that point, and not specifically relating to the legislation, uh, Cabinet Secretary, previously this committee heard uh, in relation to the domestic abuse about coercive and controlling behaviour and how uh, that might not always be evident to other, other parties. In relation to harassment of witnesses that happens on a regular basis, uh, the uh, internet, social media is quite often used to, to, to be uh, to that end. Does the task force have access to expertise on that? Because something that's often seen as very innocuous by a third party can turn out to be very pernicious and part of a longer process. Yeah, I mean, the task force at our first meeting, we didn't specifically talk about um, the, the, the issue uh, that John Finney raises as an important issue, but it wasn't specifically uh, mentioned. It was indirectly mentioned um, by, 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 by a couple of... Um, stakeholders that were present that would have an interest in this particularly, or a few stakeholders that would have an interest in this, such as Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis Scotland, um, I think it was Scotland Against Stalking, if I remember correctly, the name of the, the organisation <coughs> that was there uh, at the Victims Task Force. Uh, also, um, you know, our crime stats show us, uh, show, show very demonstrably the rise in sexual offences that are taking place in the cyber space. Uh, there's a lot of work going on to that. Um, John Finney will probably be aware, of course, that this largely, not exclusively by any stretch, but, but largely involves uh, young person on young person offences. Or maybe if I rephrase it, actually, a lot of young person on young person offences, sexual offences are, are, are committed in the cyberspace. Again, not exclusively. Uh, and then Catherine Dyer's working group is looking into this very issue about young people and sexual offending. Uh, and, and, and what steps we need to take collectively as a society, frankly, to try to deal with some of this um, as well. So it is part of a wider st uh, stream of, of, of work that's going on in the government. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, in terms of specifically looking at it, Victims Task Force not discussed specifically at the first meeting, but I've got no doubt it will inevitably be part of some of the work strands that we, uh, we take forward as a task force. That concludes our line of questioning. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and these officials for what's been a very worthwhile and encouraging evidence session. We now, that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on the 15th of January 2019, when we'll hear from the Cabinet Secretary again, this time on the management of offenders' bill. We now move into private session, and I suspend um, to allow the gallery to clear. <laughs>